In the name of our loving, liberating and life-giving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A very warm welcome to our Eucharist from St. George's Church in Berlin this third Sunday of Lent. Our preacher today is Father Martin and our soloist is Catherine and our organist Laura. Martin Abend is our recorder. Very warm welcome to this service and let us prepare ourselves to encounter Jesus Christ in his word and sacrament. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So let us come to the Lord, who is full of compassion, and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and in faith. We pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy forgive us what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may be do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke these words, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord, your God, 
for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honour your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. This is the word of the Lord. And speak to God. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims the his handiwork. One day pours out its song to another, and one night unfolds knowledge to another. They have neither speech nor language, and their voices are not heard. Yet their sound has gone out into all lands, and their words to the ends of the world. In them has he sent a tabernacle for the sun, that comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber and rejoices as a champion to run his course. It goes forth from the end of the heavens and runs to the very end again. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statues of the Lord are right and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, dripping from the honeycomb. By them also is your servant taught. And in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often they offend? O oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins, lest they get dominion over me. So shall I be undefiled and innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then, then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed in scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you for having prayed with me with the words of Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Dear sisters, dear brothers in our Lord Jesus Christ, who am I to open my mouth here on this pulpit of St. George's Church in Berlin? 
we prayed together in the same psalm, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. And for me, speaking on this pulpit, this means, keep me, Lord, from my own thoughts, even if they are well meant. My task today is to proclaim to you the good news, the gospel about Jesus Christ crucified. As the Apostle Paul reminds me and you in his letter to the Christians in Corinth, I should tell the good news without wisdom of words, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied in its effectiveness, that the content of the cross may not be thrown away and dismissed by trying to explain it. So I wish I could leave my position on this pulpit to Jesus Christ himself, to explain his suffering and death on the cross of Golgotha for us. This week, I was amazed when I looked at the pulpit in Berlin's church of St. Georgios, the former Protestant church of John the Evangelist, in Auguststraße in Mitte, now leased to Syrian Orthodox Christians. You see in this picture the pulpit of a Protestant church, and it's out of function in an Orthodox church, as the priest there preaches from the steps of the altar, not from the pulpit. So what did they do with the pulpit? They mounted the cross of Golgotha in the center of the pulpit at this very place where I stand now, including the body of Jesus Christ died on the cross. Amazing. And speaking silently more strongly about the meaning of the cross than any sermon can. But here I stand, called to preach the good news of Christ crucified. St. Paul warns us that the more we rationalize about the meaning of the cross, the less we will attain its good effect on us. And why? We have heard it in today's epistle. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God or in my own translation of these last words, to us Christians, it is the dynamic energy of God. The Apostle Paul remarks out of his experience with talking about Jesus Christ to various people outside of the very small Christian church of his time, the cross is foolishness to all who do not believe in the one crucified on this cross, who do not believe that he was the Son of God, was God himself. And is this not our experience too, when talking to other people? When Paul speaks of foolishness, he does not mean stupidity or the incapacity to understand or a diminished intelligence quotient of those who deride the idea of the cross as a sign of God's victory over hatred, violence, and death. Rather, Paul means that the proclamation of the cross as a sign of salvation of humankind is for all non-Christians a complete absence of wisdom in the common sense. That is, a Christian use of reason against logic, purposely play, playing the fool, purposely being absurd in logic. Now, looking more closely at the rejection of the gospel about Jesus Christ crucified, Paul at first sees the opposition of his former Jewish co-religionists. For them, the Jews, cross, the cross is a stumbling block. A skandalon, as the Greeks say, a scandal which in the Greek language is not only the noun for a trap, a snare, 
but also a vivid expression for a revolting idea, a strong offense, an infamy. Jesus, a crucified Messiah? Impossible for most of Jewish thought even today. As the Jewish expectation of the future Messiah is that of a powerful ruler, establishing world justice and world peace by miracles and by force. This originally Jewish opposition against the cross as a symbol of God's humility and weakness has been shared later by most Muslims and by all those who cannot accept the idea that God can be incarnate, that God is present in a human body and a human soul of the man of Nazareth. Now, this opposition against a crucified suffering Messiah has been shared also by Christians from the fourth century up to the high Middle Ages, from the Emperor Constantine, who saw the cross of Christ as a good omen for his military victories, to our Germanic ancestors here in Germany, who would not believe the Christian missionaries entering their lands unless they depicted Christ on the cross as a victorious athlete fighting Satan in a battle of life and death. And then in a second step, Paul sees the opposition of the Gentiles, here called the Greeks, because they were the first pagans who came into contact with Christianity by the very Apostle Paul. We may add to them in our days many secular, more or less irreligious people in our supposedly post-Christian era. Their opposition to the cross centers around its understanding as a folly. In Paul's time, a halfway educated Greek would dismiss anything which fails to satisfy common intellectual sense as ludicrous nonsense as it is portrayed in a caricature of the time, a graffiti found on the Palatine Hill in Rome of a Christian slave bowing down to a crucified male human figure with an ass's head. Inscribed in Greek, Alaximenos worships his god. And in our age, ridiculing of Christian beliefs and in particular of the idea of the crucifixion of a man as a revelation of God, is a normal, is a widespread, as much as it was in early Christianity. And let me add the present contempt of the cross as a symbol of violence and repression in the name of Christianity. This opposition is shared not by a few Christians, in our Western European society. Ever since the said Emperor Constantine in the year 312 mounted the cross onto the shield of his warriors and won in this sign of the cross, the cross often stood for Christian forces conquering bloodily in the name of Christ, from the Crusaders to the world mission in the 19th century. Here in Berlin, we recently experienced an echo of this hostility against the cross when there was widespread opposition to the mounting of a replica of the original golden cross on the cupola of Berlin's newly reconstructed city castle. Contempt for an outright hostility to the central symbol of Christianity across has been and still is widespread. But this cannot be the theme of a sermon on this pulpit. What is the positive meaning of the cross to us Christians who believe that Jesus of Nazareth, who died on the cross, is the Son of God and is our Savior? To this, Paul gives an astonishing answer unexpected at first glance, 
The cross, for us Christians, is as much a symbol of weakness and foolishness as it is for Jews, pagans, Greeks, and secular contemporaries. The decisive difference is the following. We Christians believe that it is the symbol of God's weakness and of God's foolishness. And that changes all. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength, as Paul puts it. And to say it more precisely, in a double way, as St. Paul does, we are pondering now on the weakness of God's communication of our salvation to us. God remains the Almighty, but God empties himself of his power and becomes a weak human. And in his human weakness, dying on the cross, he is stronger than the human power which executes the death penalty on him. And we are pondering on the foolishness of God's communication of our salvation to us. God remains wisdom itself. God remains the source of all human reasoning. But God takes up the role of a human fool who, in his foolishness, representing the humanly absurd is wiser than the human wisdom. Christian believe, Christians believe that the cross is the annihilation of any sign of power and wisdom, contrary to the history of the widespread misuse of the cross in the political world and also in the intellectual world. The cross expresses the conviction that human weakness Human humility, human simplicity and love reflect those same divine soft forces which win in the end of history. This is the main reason why we Christians cross ourselves when praying. So much for some positive symbolism of the Christian cross, but my task was not to preach the good news of, Jesus, of the cross, but the good news of Jesus Christ crucified. So let us now turn to Jesus himself. The Bishop John Chrysostom of Antioch, when preaching about the verses of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in the fourth century, and we are in the lucky position to have his sermon still extant, he made an explaining comparison. When Jesus healed the blind man at the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem, he put mud on the eyes of the blind man. So he made, in fact, him more blind, as it were, in order that then he might see. In a similar way, Jesus conquered death by dying on the cross, by making the situation worse. And then, as a dead human being, overcoming death as a god. As Orthodox Christians sing in their Paschal Vigil, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. For human eyes and comprehension, God often works undercover, as it were, even contrary to eyesight and contrary to reasoning. And this is why we should be very cautious in trying to explain in rational terms why it was necessary for God to die on the cross in order to save us from eternal death. For 2,000 years now, since in Paul's letter to the Romans, Chris Christ's death on the cross has been explained as an atonement, a substitute sacrifice of the man Jesus of Nazareth for the sins of all his fellow human beings, an act of obedience to a God who requires such a deadly sacrifice 
for the sake of the universal rule of his justice, his justice being understood as a justice functioning by the law of retaliation. The clue, the clue to accept Jesus' death on the cross as a necessary step on his way to offer us salvation from evil and salvation from death and to offer us eternal life, the clue is not justice as the saving property of God. Rather, it is divine love. Jesus once told his disciples in the Gospel of John, we can read it, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So then, let us put aside the age-old dogma of atonement for a while today. Let us instead follow the spirit of the love of God, poured out on each of us at our baptism. If we really believe that God is love, as it is proclaimed Sunday by Sunday on this pulpit, if we really believe, really believe that God is freely forgiving our sins without recompense, then we ought to admire and to praise Jesus Christ for dying on the cross instead of calling this death foolishness. Because inspired by God's love, we will believe that his death on the cross is a sign of greater love than the love of our fathers and of our mothers, the love of our brothers and sisters, the love of our sons and daughters, the love of our friends, and the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Believing in the cross as the most powerful symbol of God's unending love for each one of us, it will cease to be an object of offense or even of hate, and it will become an object of attraction. Then, believing in a loving God, the cross can fulfill its true mission to be a source of hope that God is eternally present, present in the dying and living body of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, present in our mortal bodies and souls before and after our death, because we in our bodies, souls and hearts are God's eternal temples, present in all of his creation, lovingly embraced by Jesus Christ with his arms stretched out on the cross. God's unending presence is the reason why we find crosses on Christian graves. And it is the reason why at Easter we can sing, Behold, through the cross joy has come into all the world. By enduring the cross for us, he destroyed death by death. Now, if you want to experience physically that the cross is not only a symbol of death, but also of life and of love stronger than death, a symbol not only of darkness, of, our, of the hour of our death, but also of the light of light eternal, so if you want to experience this physically, then you have a chance. In the following weeks of Lent, up to Good Friday, the 2nd of April. Go, please, to the St. Matthäuskirche in Tiergarten. That is the church next to the Berlin Philharmonic Hall, open for visitors Tuesdays to Sundays from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. I invite you now to look at this picture and to enter with me for a brief visit now. You will not enter. Uh, the church proper, but this giant black wooden cross. The branches of this cross are about three meters high and two meters wide and hollow so that you may walk into it. And as you progress, you will come into complete darkness at the intersection of the two branches of the cross. 
And then you have to grope your way out of a small labyrinth of walls, keeping you in complete darkness, until finally you reach the upper end of the cross. And here, suddenly, from inside the black cross, you see the daylight and the altar of the church as the place of God's presence in word and sacrament. It is a physical experience not only of light after darkness, but in our time of the COVID pandemic, it is also an experience that there will be light at the end of the tunnel whatever it takes to reach that final point. So I recommend you a visit to this walkable cross, and not for curiosity's sake, but for a prayerful meditation of the meaning of the cross for you. May you be blessed by the cross of Jesus Christ, which is neither a sign of weakness nor of strength, but rather, as St. Paul puts it in his epistle for today, it is a sign of God's good energy manifested in his life-giving, unending love. Amen. Let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the Church, for the world, and for each other. But of our salvation we trust in your promise. Lord, you come to your temple with zeal and indignation. Come to your Church and drive from it all false piety and misguided priorities. 
May our words, thoughts and deeds be acceptable in your sight. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you come to places of power and some are affronted at your audacity. Open the hearts of all in leadership to challenge of your kingdom. Revive us in your justice. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have have mercy. Lord, you come to traders with a vision that extends beyond profit. Keep us mindful of the conditions of production and social effects of what we consume. Balance all our trading with your fairness and equity. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you come to our lives with compassion and searching judgment. In our frailty, give us time to reflect on on what is amiss and in repentance to seek your restoring grace. Create in us a fitting dwelling place for your glory. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, come with the promise of your resurrection. We pray for all our loved ones, loved ones departed. And by name we pray especially for Melanie Jacobs. Give comfort and hope to all who mourn. Bring us to new life with you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be also always with you. And also with you. Let us give one another a sign.
let us pray. Merciful Father, turn us from sin to faithfulness and from disobedience to love and prepare us to celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ our Saviour, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. Who in the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it them, to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Mary and all the saints to, to the feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. 
Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are all body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean. Our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body 
live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.